Hello, and welcome to this week's look at action and stunts on film and television. How are you? Good to see you. Um, if you are of a nervous disposition, <laughs> this week's episode may not be for you. We are in 1990, and a movie that really, when you break it down, had all the hallmarks of being a belter because um, it stars Michael Caine and Roger Moore in the same movie. Now, I appreciate that when when Roger was big, and I, I, of course he's been a star his whole life, but um, when he was really big during that 70s period, he was Bond. And when Michael Caine, uh, during that period of time, of course Michael Caine would make you know a movie a week, Back then, probably buying somebody a house or somebody else needed a house. He has a lot of relatives. So they never got an opportunity to work together. And there was probably projects knocking about, you know, but they, I think the audience probably wanted something along the same lines as Man Who Would Be King. You know, the success of seeing Michael and Sean Connery together on screen was exciting enough to go, why haven't they had an opportunity to do this before? So, you know, having Michael Caine and Roger Moore in a movie, it's an exciting possibility. And then you realise, a little later down the line, that it's written and directed by Michael Winner. And already there are red flags going off left, right and centre. Um... I think it's perfectly possible for um, in the dictionary for the word trigger warning. If you look at it, then it, it would say see Michael Winner. I think that's possibly uh, a safe bet because even though Roger, Sean, Michael Winner, they were mates. They'd known each other for many years and probably, you know, you do that with, with certain situations. Maybe you overlook the fact that one of your mates is a lunatic. And I don't say that lightly. You know, we've had first-hand experience of understanding how complicated and deranged Michael Winner was um, in uh, his later life. In fact, in his younger life, to be fair with you. But, I mean, certainly in, in his later life, first-hand experiences of people who have dealt with him and have said to themselves, this guy is just off the chart you know uh, so i appreciate that he's thought to himself i want to do a movie i want to bring my pals together and we'll have a good old jolly and it'll be fantastic now it is written co-written by morris gran and lawrence marks um, if you are fans of british comedy you will remember birds of a feather and a show called Goodnight Sweetheart. They wrote and created those shows, and they were hugely successful. Um, so, you know, there was no issues there as far as that was concerned. And then also, it is co-written, and the story is devised by lyricist Leslie Brickus. The man who wrote the lyrics to You Only Live Twice is partially is partially responsible for the story of bullseye and again you know you go okay well it's they're all mates together they i think they're all part of the um uh they had a thing called the orphans club they're all part of this team where they all got together and had lunch and did this and that and bloody blah, blah so it's a movie possibility that really should have been terrific and i remember going to see it at the cinema and i was excited by the whole thing you know the, the previous year i'd seen um uh lethal weapon 2 license to kill indiana jones and the last crusade so there's a whole bunch of stuff you go well roger moore movie and a michael Caine picture yes let me have a slice of that pie and i sat in the cinema and was dumbfounded by how appalling it really was which was such a shame really such a shame there is so much that could have been done 
to save this picture from the dark, murky waters of shocking, shockingdom. Um, and I remember reading stuff about it later on after I'd seen it, and the fact that the only person laughing at any of the gags during the, the, the premiere of the film was Michael Winner. It, they were all in gags, you know, and a lot of the stuff just wasn't particularly funny. It's not... You've got top comedy writers who are responsible for writing two very... what Birds of a Feather particularly uh, was an extraordinary award-winning sitcom uh, which ran for many, many years, three major characters, and and was a huge success. Good Night, Sweetheart, Nicholas Wynn, Lindhurst, of course, from Only Falls and Horses. Another really good show. Nice idea, bit of time travel uh, thrown into the mix, but funny, Saturday night funny. And you put all of those people together, and they come up with this car crash. And car crash, you know is is a, a nice little segue for me to the one thing that probably saves the film from being unwatchable uh which is the stunt work royal on as stunt coordinator goes in and uh you know works with um with and goes in from a location scouting position i, I believe and went in from the from the very start you know, working out the possibilities and, and uh, Michael Winner saying, well, I'd like this and I want that. And, and, and Roy apparently standing by his guns and going, no, no, you can't have that you, you, because that's not right. You have to do this instead or we have to build this. You can't just, you can't just drive vehicles into this, for instance. Um, there is a, um, a scene uh, which we'll have a look at briefly at the top of this, um, where a, a vehicle uh, crashes into a skip. That skip had to be purchased by the company and brought in situ. Uh, but as far as Michael Winner was concerned, if there was a skip there, you know, they, they, the idea was that they would bring in. Well, that's all right. We'll just use what's on the street. We'll 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 make it. It's like like a commando production. You know, you turn up. Oh, what's here? Right. Well, let's do that. Let's utilise what's around us. And so it's, um, you know, seat of your pants stuff. But Roy had to make it very clear, as I think many people did, no, you can't do that, Michael. You have to do this and that, etc. So he has a reputation for being a way wayward. And the action, there are certain action set pieces along the picture that work. Um, there are a number which, I, and I, I seem to think that there's a motorbike chase at the end which... Um, the edit gives the impression that it was much longer and it was edited way back and so I think there's a there's a, a bunch of other bits and pieces missing from that but the edit in the film makes it relatively short but we will have a look at these and uh, pick the bones out of it and here it comes so bullseye let's make the best out of this shall we this is a parking problem uh, Roger as the character in the back, having a quick butchers at some saucy pictures, and your man drives into a car and then into a skip. Um, the car that's been driven into is driven by Nick Gillard, who gets out and uh, is decidedly unpleased by this and gives the driver a bit of a talking to. As you do. Broken home. Now, here's the gag that is kind of based on that Buster Keaton routine. He goes to the house, the door falls in, then he hear look, there's the demolition ball, and the house comes, the facade comes down. But I don't, for a, not in a million years do I think somebody's standing there. I think that's a dummy. They can get away with that because of where it is and the way in which it's shot and the steam and the dust everywhere and all that sort of stuff. Pedal power, right, on the bike, he's doing the window cleaner routine, he's got to try and get up a steep, it's not very steep, it's just the way that it's filmed, if you look at it, it's, it looks steep from there, but I sus look, so that's not, a, that's the camera in a slightly different position, I think, and uh, gets up, realises, this is bloody hard work, takes his feet off, and then starts wandering backwards, and... Uh, he keeps going, keeps going, <laughs> and roots himself into the side of a Volvo. The window cleaner on this instance is actually played by 
our dear friend Roy Alon, who is the uh, the man up there on the side of the building. He wants him. Oi, you've got to get back to the office. The boss knows what you've been doing with his with his secretary. He goes, oh, blimey, down he comes. And then Michael goes up. And it's a very odd sequence, this. But clearly, on the outside of the building, ropes, you know, getting across from one place to the other. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Uh, surprised. I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, uh, Roy did that as well, seeing as he was up there in the first place. And then this is a moment in here. So he's breaking in. He's got to get a key. He doesn't know where the key is. And a little dog comes in and he says, right. And then then the big lad turns up and he goes, oh, Lord, there's the key. Right. OK. Throws the other dog. Roy comes back as if to go, oh, I've been to the office. Right. I'm having this. I'm going to take the stuff back. And he starts taking the stuff down from the side. The cradle. He throws the dog and then it cuts to uh, obviously a trained dog. Uh, and um, again, I'm assuming it's Terry Walsh. I've, I've got nothing else to, to, to back that up at this stage. But And then swinging out, possibly Roy, swinging out and trying to push away from the building or trying to shimmy his way down the ropes. And then it cuts. It's a very odd cut to Michael obviously swinging outside and there's a there's a seance taking place with these deers in the room can you hear us and he comes crashing in through the window and then for reasons known to somebody else gets everybody to sing happy birthday it's very odd this is a running gag as well this guy grabs this poor woman who is now to be doubled by tina maskell way bosh straight into the stream so that's the first time it happens. And he says, hey, buy a drink. He says that every time. Then there's a fight in the kilt. So it's the doubles and the doubles. And this guy is Kieran Shah. Now, you may know Kieran because he was uh, perspective double on Lord of the Rings, doubled all the leads. Also Christopher Reeve's perspective double on Superman and the guy that gives the bad dates in Raiders of the Lost Ark and is an Ewok in Return of the Jedi. So, fighting takes place here, everybody fighting with everybody else, and that's ter it's really the only time you get to see Terry Walsh coming towards camera, flipped over, and the chase is on. This is the second version of, hey buddy, buy a drink, and uh, she's chucked into the, oh dear, another day at the office for Tina, look, hey buddy, buy a drink, oh my goodness. And then the third time it happens, and uh, so, and then this box is thrown down, and bosh, right on top of her, dear Lord. Oh, my goodness. Hey, buy a drink. Right. The motorbike chase. This is the, the largest action sequence in the whole thing. So the two villains are in the VW, and they're driving away, and the two heroes, alleged heroes, jump onto this abandoned motorcycle, Michael on the front, Roger on the back, and off they go. Now, riding the motorcycle is Eddie Kidd. Um, on the back, um, I think it's Stuart Clark on the back. Again, I've, 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 I spoke to Eddie, but he's not, he's not, doesn't remember. Jeff Hewitt Davis here going into the water. And then the combination of shots, you can see that the pair of them, they're on a rig, and they're obviously not going terribly quickly. A motorbike jump, obviously. Got to have a, a jump in there, and Eddie jumps the stream. There's a couple of moments where they're very clearly not going very quickly at all there. That's a great example of that. And then they come through here, and I think that's Sarah Franzel jumping out of the way. Watch the guy in the kilt on the right, jumps into a bucket. And then there's a moment... There's the two cars coming through here. There's a moment where Roger's on the back and Eddie's on the front. And then it switches to uh, another rig whereby both of the actors are there. Turning the corner, missing that car there, up this ramp. I have no idea what that's doing. But anyway, all the way up there and over the top of the building, landing on top of the car and throwing them out into the parking spot. And there is Eddie between the two stars it's a 
bizarre film from start to finish. Uh, good collection. You can see majority of those would have been driving or additional bits and pieces here and there. And um, they've Roy and the team have clearly done a much much better job than the writers and the director very clearly. Oh boy, that's it. That is bullseye. And you can all breathe a sigh of relief now that that's been covered. Um, Tina Maskell doing wonders there. I mean, you know, b b doubling this this actress who whose husband character. Hey, buddy, I buy a drink. And I was obsessed with this this one line and the whole thing with um, the window cleaner routine. Of course, Roy has the window cleaner. The boss knows what you've been doing with his secretary. Oh my God! Of course, he goes and um, and then crashes in through the window. I've got a pretty good idea that that's again. I, I'm assuming based on information received that it's Stuart Clark. But, uh, uh, you know, tricky to get confirmations at this stage. But that's my understanding of it. And uh, and to write this bizarre scene. So the, the window cleaner crashes in through the window. They're having a seance. Can you hear me? And all that sort of stuff. And he gets up and says, Happy birthday to you. And, and they all start joining in. Go, what is going on? Utter chaos from start to finish. Um, one movie that I probably wouldn't want to have been a fly on the wall in I think definitely um, and I've only got very very angry during those meetings and stormed out next week oh much better next week yeah we're Frankenheimer and we are in Paris and it is Ronin next week fabulous fabulous movie lots of great stuff to have a look at and uh, I hope you can join me then Wednesday for the podcast, Friday for the YouTube show. Check out the Pod Dojo Network. They are responsible for the podcast. And until then, it's bye for now. Mm -hmm.